nation's capital on this beautiful election day in Washington, D.C. I'm Carol Costello. It has been one of the most bitter and polarizing elections in modern history. And the nation is just now, just hours from electing a brand new president. Hillary Clinton casting her vote in the last hour near her home in suburban New York. She campaigned well after midnight, and so did her rival Donald Trump, who this morning is predicting victory. We're doing very well in North Carolina. I think we're doing very, very well in Florida. Uh, Those are the two most well. important we're early states, well aren't they? Excuse me? Those are the two most important early states, Florida and North Carolina. Well, I think they're very important. I think we're doing well there. We're doing very well in New Hampshire. Ohio is incredible. It's just a great place. Uh, these are, I mean, these are, the people are just amazing in this country. Ohio, we're doing incredibly. Uh, we're going to win Iowa. Voting now underway across most of the United States. We're already seeing lines in many of the polling stations. Here in yellow are the states opening their polling sites this hour. Most are already up and running in the eastern and central time zones. The weather should not play a huge role in today's turnout. No excuses. There could be some rain showers in a few key states in the Midwest and the Great Lakes region, but nothing big. CNN has deployed its vast resources to bring you the his this historic election like no one else can. We're covering both presidential campaigns, all the angles, and the races that will decide who controls Congress under our next president. Let's begin, though, with Joe Johns and the Clinton camp. Hi, Joe. A beautiful morning here in Chappaqua, New York, uh, uh, for Hillary Clinton as she and her husband, the former president, went out to vote around 8 o'clock Eastern time. We'd been told she was going to show up a bit earlier, around 6.30 this morning, but that would have been hard to do given the fact that she arrived back at White Plains around 3.30 this morning, greeted by supporters. She was greeted uh, at the elementary school where she voted this morning by, among others, her congresswoman the Democrat Nita Lowy uh, from this area. Uh, she talked uh, just a bit after she voted. And interesting, uh, listen to the tone of Hillary Clinton uh, trying not to show any sign of inevitability, uh, uh, suggesting that uh, if she wins, uh, she's going to do uh, a good job for the entire country. Listen to this. It is the most humbling feeling, Dan, because, you know, I know how much responsibility goes with this, and uh, so many people are counting on the outcome of this election, what it means for our country, and I'll do the very best I can if I'm fortunate enough to, to win today. This campaign has been so careful about the issue of tone coming all the way down to election day, uh, putting out even the fact that she's put together both a winning speech and a losing speech, depending on what happens tonight. Hillary Clinton expecting to have a very light schedule throughout the day here in New York, going to do a number of radio interviews and then make her way over to the city for what she and her supporters hope will be a victory celebration. Back to you, Carol. All right, Joe Johns reporting live from Chappaqua this morning. Now let's turn to the Trump campaign and head out to New York City. CNN's Jason Carroll is there. Hi, Jason. And good morning to you. Donald Trump expected to vote here at about 10 o'clock at PS59. Expected to walk right through those doors when we see the crowds of people lining up to vote. It's all in the voters' hands at this point. Yesterday, Donald Trump, five states making five stops, Carol, going over much of the themes that we've heard throughout his campaign, that the system is rigged. He's going to repeal and replace Obamacare. He's the candidate of the working class. He is the candidate who can clean up Washington, D.C. You know, we've heard Donald Trump say so much about what he's going to do if he wins. We've also, throughout this campaign, Carol, heard him repeatedly talk about how he would feel if he did not win. Again, we've heard it throughout the campaign. We heard him say it again yesterday, and he said it again this morning. If I don't win, I will consider it a tremendous waste of time, energy, and money. I'm going to be, sure. I, I will have spent over $100 million of my own campaign, meaning I don't have to take you know, tremendous. Stuff. I don't have to take the money from all the fat cats that mm -hmm. are going to tell you what to do. I think it's a big asset. It doesn't get talked about much. But, yeah. So you, you know, feel that a, way? I think it's a tremendous asset. But no, I will consider it. Uh, I will not consider it great if I don't win. 
And you know, with so much talk throughout the campaign from Donald Trump about the system being rigged, in his words, there's been a question about what he would say tonight if he did not win. Of course, the campaign expecting that he will win, but if he did not win, what would he say? Would he concede? Well, this morning, Donald Trump Jr. speaking about that, saying so long as it's a quote fair fight, so long as it's a fair fight, and it's evident that it's a fair fight, he fully expects his father to concede. But once again, fully expects his father to win tonight. Carol. All right, Jason Carroll reporting live from New York City. One of the key battleground states is Florida, and it's not just the presidential race that's sending voters to the polls this morning. Let's check in with CNN's Boris Sanchez. He's in Miami-Dade County. Good morning, Boris. Hey, good morning, Carol. Yeah, the big story here in Florida has been turnout. Already historic. More than six and a half million Floridians have already cast their ballots in the Sunshine State. That's more people than voted in the entire 2000 election. And it's also who's voting that's important. There's been a huge uptick in the number of Latinos coming out to early vote in this election. An 89% jump compared to 2008. And of course, the big question is who are those Latinos and who are they supporting? Here here in Miami-Dade County, a huge Cuban-American community, it is imperative for the Republicans, if they want to win Florida, to hold on to these voters. The problem is that there's a generational divide between this traditionally GOP-leaning demographic. I spoke to a younger voter just a few moments ago. His name was Jonathan, and he told me that his family is split. He's Cuban. He's young. He's more liberal. He says his parents are conservative. He jokes that his mom made him sleep outside because of his support for Hillary Clinton. The idea is that if Donald Trump can cut into the Democrats' advantage here in these communities, he puts Florida into play. Democrats right now have about a 90,000 vote advantage. To give you some perspective, back in 2012, Democrats had about a 100,000 vote advantage in early vote going into election day. Democrats are trying to hold on to that lead and you mentioned the Senate race. They're also hoping that a lot of the votes that are going against Donald Trump in the Latino community go to Patrick Murphy in that tight race between him and Marco Rubio. Republicans so far are confident that Rubio can win. He's put out several ads uh, in the past few weeks. He's also very popular being Cuban, uh, uh, Cuban American in this Cuban American community. So he's hoping that uh, they will go his his direction, Carol. All right, Boris Sanchez reporting live from Florida this morning. Another highly coveted prize for both campaigns, North Carolina. The swing state home to 15 electoral votes who went to President Obama in 2008 but turned red for Romney in 2012. CNN's Gary Tuckman is live there. Good morning. Carol, good morning to you. Welcome to the Mount Moriah Baptist Church in the heart of Charlotte, North Carolina, which today is one of 2,700 precincts in this swing state of North Carolina. Business is brisk. The polls open at 6.30 a.m. Want to give you a look at how it works here. You walk into the church, you come up to this desk, and you sign in. You put your name and address, telling them who you are. You do not need an ID in the state of North Carolina. You then take that piece of paper to this desk. If your last name starts with A to C, you come here, you show them the slip, they verify that you live here. Hello? You're all smiling today, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay, Everyone's happy. It's election day here. They verify you're in this precinct, and then you walk over here to one of the 21 video voting machines. There are 21 in this room. You pay cast your vote, not just for President of the United States, but also two other very tight races here in this state, for governor and for U.S. Senate, which could ultimately determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. One thing I want to point out that's amazing, Carol. If not one person voted in the state of North Carolina today, if everyone woke up and said, we're not voting today, there would still be a 45% voter turnout. 3.1 million people voted in early voting here in North Carolina. There are a total of 6.9 million registered voters. That so was 45% to start. So there will be a very high turnout here in the state of North Carolina when the polls close at 7.30 p.m. Back to you. All right, Gary Tuckman reporting live from North Carolina. Thanks so much. So let's talk about this and more. Matt Visor is with me. He's a national political reporter for the Boston Globe. He's also a graduate of the great University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I had to say that because Elaine, one of my writers, there you are, is a graduate of that university. So I promised I would, sir. There you have it. David Swerdlick is the assistant editor of the Washington Post, and Ryan Lizza is the Washington correspondent for the New Yorker. Thanks to all of you, Thank you. Uh, to, for coming in because... Um, Okay, I'll start with you, person who graduated from the greatest university <laughs> yeah, in America. Keep, keep it between us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, how does it feel on this day? 
It, it's the culmination of you know a year and a half, two years. You know, watching the clips in the um, on New Day, you know, you sort of realize how far we've come. Uh, so many entertaining moments, uh, dramatic debate moments. Uh, you know, the day is finally here. It's sort of a cliche that uh, the, the the only poll that matters is on election day, and we're finally here to that to that last day. And does it give you a sense of relief, just as a person? I mean, because you know, <laughs> you've been really in it for a very long time. Yeah. We've all been in it, I, all of us up here and all, also the whole country. Uh, I feel like people need a sense of catharsis, but at the same time, um, you know, there's going to be more ahead. There will be a pause tonight, and then really political battles will continue with the new president, with Congress, and the nation figuring out how to go forward after eight years of being very accustomed to the leadership of President Obama. <laughs> okay, so I'll ask you the same question. Well, don't forget, Carol, there's less than two years to the midterm election. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, start tomorrow. Again. Yeah. As soon as the midterm elections are over, 2020 presidential elections start. So, no, I, uh, um, this has been a great election to cover. It's been fascinating. It's been terrifying sometimes. Um, and so, it's a sense of relief here at the end. Yeah, uh, me too. I'm actually excited. I mean, I want to I put up that shot from um, Raleigh, North Carolina, of the people in line waiting to vote because it's, it's incredible. This was taken yeah. when the polls just opened. I don't know what this says about voting or turn up because this is just a snapshot, right? But still, it's a beautiful thing to see democracy in action, right? That's yeah. a beautiful thing. I just you wanted know, to put that up to, to remind people what this day is all about. Although, one thing about these long lines in North Carolina is you can't forget that this is a decision made by the state to cut the number of places. There are not enough places in some of these states, and as beautiful as it is to see people online getting ready to vote, we shouldn't have long lines in this country. We should be making it as easy to right, vote so as they possible. Well, you're right about that. There should be a lot of polling places to accommodate voters so they don't have to stand in line. Uh, yeah, and this is bit, this is something that's going to carry over again to subsequent elections, right, Carol? I mean, this idea that only in states controlled by Republican legislatures has early voting been been reduced, has early vote or have the number of polling places like in North Carolina been reduced, and as demographic shift and 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 as subsequent presidential elections take place, we're really going to see if this winds up being a effective for Republicans or if Republicans are going to be forced to expand the number of the, the demographics of their voting base. Um, Matt, I want to take you back to um, April 12th, 2015. So roll the tape and we can all go back together. <laughs> Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. So you can do more than just get by. You can get ahead and stay ahead. Because when families are strong, America is strong. <laughs> so I'm hitting the road to earn your vote. Okay, so that's how Hillary Clinton announced her presidential run. Not flashy at all, but Philadelphia last night, 33,000 people, and yeah. you know, all the stars of the Democratic Party, very flashy. Yeah, and, and people, sort of, the party sort of rallying behind her extraordinary moment with the President Obama and, and Michelle Obama there as well. Uh, one interesting point is that uh, announcement video was a month after her press conference about her emails, uh, <laughs> where they thought that that would not be as big of a deal, and we're still talking about that today, in part because of the actions of James. James Comey, but they sort of underestimated, I think, how big of a deal the emails would be. Um, and Donald Trump announcing a, a couple months after that, it, it's notable that the, the way that he came out in his announcement, he talked about the same things that he's talking about today. Yeah, and, and actually, remarkably I, have, consistent. I have that moment because Hillary Clinton's tactics changed through the campaign, yeah. right? She went from going to small gatherings to like holding big rallies herself to flashy rallies with other surrogates surrounding her, right? But here's, um, Donald, I want to get the date right. Here is uh, Donald Trump. This was June 16th, 2000. Two, you see, it's yeah. cemented in your memory. Yeah. June 16th, 2015. Roll the tape. All of my life, I've heard that a truly successful person, a really, really successful person, and even modestly successful, cannot run for public office. Just can't happen. And yet, that's the kind of mindset that you need to make this country great again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. 
Also, David has, I mean, they both look more well-rested. Yeah. They look so exhausted <laughs> now. Yeah, they, they, they both look exhausted, but they both, I think, in their own ways have finished up strong. If you look at that clip of Donald Trump there, what he was talking about in the clip was this idea that he is a successful businessman, not a politician, will go out and change the political system. But it was what he said later in that speech about uh, immigrants from, uh, from Mexico in particular that wound up making the headlines the next day and set us down sort of the trajectory of what we saw for the next yeah, year. Because that, that lasted. It never did go away. No, it didn't. And let's be honest, I, I, don't, I barely remember Hillary Clinton's uh, initial kickoff or any lines or phrases from it. It was a fairly generic, um, let's every, let everyone get ahead. And message. love each other. <laughs> and all of us remember that speech from, from Donald Trump because maybe we were watching it live and mocking it or not taking him seriously um, or just the consistency of his message through the entire primary campaign, the, fa the fascination, frankly, of Donald Trump with us in the, in the, in the television world. Um, um, obviously got way more coverage than anyone else and for better or worse that was the dynamic I mean Hillary Clinton never, even in the general election when it was the, just the two of them um, Trump managed to, to dominate the debate become more memorable um, frankly for perhaps for, perhaps for worse if he, if, if he loses yeah. um, she ran as a fairly generic moderate Democrat um, with without a, a truly sharp message and I, th I think Donald Trump has this reputation for being so unscripted uh, but that first announcement speech, you know, he talked about building the wall. He talked about his anti-trade rhetoric and ISIS, you know, and, and it was sort of much more planned out than I think we give him credit for a lot of times. And he taught, he was consistent with that message throughout the, the campaign, you know, stumbling uh, plenty along the way. But Hillary Clinton sort of struggled to find that one slogan. I mean, they would change these slogans almost week to week to oh, try I remember find the that. right moment or the right sort of tent. Did she ever come up yeah. with a the in, slogan in, that stuck? Not really. The slogan was that the slogan ultimately was that Donald Trump was unfit. <laughs> when in that initial message that she released, she was preparing, as you were mentioning, yeah. to run against the conventional candidate like a Jeb Bush, like a Marco Rubio, where she would have had to defend her policy positions a little more, had to defend the record of the Obama administration a little more. She wound up not expecting to run against Trump, and then it became less about the issues. She wasn't running against a, a died in the wool conservative. Well, I think she was well, also me, surprised no, by Bernie Sanders, right? First, I'm with her. So she was embracing the fact of her, yeah. the historic nature of her, of president. Let me give her a little bit more credit because remember, the first thing we remember from Trump's uh, initial speech was, frankly, calling Mexican immigrants rapists. Right. The next thing we remember from his campaign is banning Muslims. What was her, what was her slogan? Stronger together, right? This was about her campaign was about celebrating our diversity and that we're all in this together. His was about there are certain groups that are out to kill us or out to commit crimes against us, and I'm the guy to put a stop to that. I mean, that's fundamentally what the, what the debate was at the, at the well, end. Well, we'll see whose message, uh, you know, <laughs> was louder for the voters today. So, you guys stick around because we have much more to talk about still to come on this election day. We're heading out west where the polls have just opened. I'll be right back.